San Diego Mayor Bob Filner is now getting sued by the city. I'm Dwayne Brown. The latest legal developments tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. The lawsuit unfolds as another woman steps forward, telling of unwanted advances by the mayor. She spoke exclusively with KPBS. Also tonight, the Justice Department makes a big payment to a UC San Diego student detained in a cell on drug charges and left without food or water for nearly a week. I'm Peggy Pico. It's supposed to take seven and a half minutes or less for a first responder to get to a life-threatening emergency. Why that critical time nearly doubles in five San Diego neighborhoods. Then how the new Think Local First initiative could increase jobs and city revenue. The Marine Corps' newest fighter jet arrives at Miramar Air Station as commanders make plans for a scaled-back air show. We'll tell you what's in the works. And in a summer where race relations have made national headlines, we talk with San Diego's retiring assistant police chief about the difference he's made from walking the beat in mid-city to police headquarters. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. The mayor of San Diego is now being sued by the city of San Diego. Council voted unanimously today to file a cross-complaint against Mayor Bob Filner. The move is designed to protect the city in connection with a sexual harassment lawsuit filed by Filner's former communications director. Tonight, the council is considering Filner's request for the city to pay his legal fees in the suit. An eighth woman has stepped forward to accuse Filner of unwanted sexual advances. She says Filner tried to kiss her after a business meeting in 2011 when he was a congressman. She spoke to KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma, who joins us with this update. Amitha, who is this woman and what did she tell you? Lisa Curtin is Director of Government and Military Education at San Diego City College. She says in 2011, ex-Congressman Jim Bates set up a meeting between her and then-Congressman Filner to discuss potential uses for property near the old Naval Training Center. Curtin says after the meeting, Filner asked to meet with her in private. She said once alone, Filner grabbed her left hand, twirled her wedding band, and asked if it was real. Curtin said she responded with, it's about 25 years worth of wedding band. He then asked me if it could come off while I was in DC and if I would go out with him. And I said I really didn't think so. And at that point he pulled my hand closer to him and he reached over to kiss me. I turned my head at that moment and on the side of my face I got a very wet saliva filled kiss including feeling his tongue on my cheek. Did she tell anyone else about the alleged incident? Curtin says she quickly left Filner's office to meet her staff outside and told them what happened. She says she told them she'd never meet with Filner alone again. Curtin said at the time, neither she nor her staffers reported the incident to authorities because of shock and fear. Filner made it very clear how powerful he thought he was. He discussed that in the meeting, the kind of authority that he had, that he'd been pulling strings all over San Diego for many years. And now Dwayne Curtin says she has since lodged a complaint with the San Diego Sheriff's Department's hotline established to take calls from potential victims of Filner's alleged misconduct. Filner's office did not respond to a request for comment. Now, Lisa Curtin is the eighth woman to come forward with accusations against the mayor, Mitha, right? Right, and they're all women in powerful positions, Dwayne, ranging from his former communications director, Irene McCormick-Jackson, to a retired Navy rear admiral. They're all accusing Fulner of unwanted touching, kissing, and derogatory comments. All of them, except McCormick-Jackson, have sat down with KPBS to tell their stories, and we have the interviews online at kpbs.org. Our investigative reporter, Amitha Sharma. Ninth District Councilwoman Marty Emerald is urging the mayor to take his time out for therapy, but is not calling on him to resign. Emerald was out of town when accusations against Filner came to light. Today, she made her first public comments on the issue. I do not believe it is my place to be the judge or the jury for our mayor, but I do know it is my place as an elected woman and as a community leader to stand up 
and speak out on behalf of those who have been harmed and stand with them, every woman, in solidarity. Thank you very much. Emerald and 4th District Councilwoman uh, Myrtle Cole are the only council members who have not called for Filner to step down. You can, of course, find all of our coverage of this ongoing story online at kpbs.org slash news slash Filner. The federal government will pay more than $4 million to a San Diego college student who's left in a drug enforcement agency holding cell for nearly five days without food or water last year. KPBS reporter Jill Replogel joins us from the News Center with more on the story. Remind us what happened to this student, Jill. Well, his name is Daniel Chong. He's a 23-year-old student at UCSD. And he was asleep at a friend's apartment in April of 2012 after a night of partying when a DEA narcotics task force raided the apartment. The DEA had been monitoring the place for a while for drug activity. And after taking Chong and others to a DEA office in San Diego, agents determined that Chong wasn't involved. They asked him to wait a few minutes in a locked holding cell, and then no one came back to get him for four and a half days. He suffered severe dehydration, his kidneys nearly failed, he had hallucinations, and even after he recovered in the hospital, he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And Chong spoke at a news conference earlier this morning uh, with his lawyers on side, alongside him. Let's hear what he had to say about his ordeal. I think it was just what, what it sounded like. It was an accident, a really, really bad, horrible accident. Now, Jill, besides the money for Chong, what else came out of the settlement? Well, Chong's lawyers said the DEA had already put in place policies to keep track of detainees and ensure they're treated humanely, and that is directly as a result of this incident. On another note, the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Justice is finishing up an independent investigation into the debacle. A DEA spokeswoman said she couldn't discuss the incident until that report was finalized. KPBS reporter Jill Replogo. A federal report says agents are miscalculating wait times at ports along the U.S.-Mexico border using different methods at different border crossings. Delays at the border can be up to three hours and cost nearly $8 billion in 2011. Emergency responders aren't getting to some folks fast enough and the results are deadly. Peggy Pico finds out why some of San Diego's poorest neighborhoods have the longest delays. Voice of San Diego published an investigative report documenting delays in the amount of time it takes first responders to arrive at a life-threatening emergency after a 911 call. The results were disturbing. Here to explain the situation is journalist Liam Dillon and San Diego Assistant Fire Chief Brian Fennessy. Welcome. Hello. Liam, walk us through emergency response time. When does the clock actually start? Sure. Most people would think that their clock would start from when they call 911 to when there's a first response responder by their side, but that's not actually how it works. The way the fire department characterizes things is when they first get the call and the police department gets the call first, so they get the call second transferred, and then from when the department gets on scene. And so there could be a delay, you know, from when someone actually gets to you, and so it's really a, a snapshot in time, not really capturing the entire thing. There's a lot of factors that go into that. Absolutely. The freeway is the, if it's a 10-story building, whatever, but Chief Fennessy, I wanted to ask you, what is the goal? You do have goals for arriving at uh, high-priority emergencies. Yeah. Our, our goal is from the time of call pickup to the time of unit arrival, seven minutes and 30 seconds. Okay, and, and how are you at reaching that goal? You know, right now our, our current data is indicating that we're reaching that goal about 69% of the time. Which is an improvement. It's an improvement over our former performance goals, which was six minutes, in, and we met that goal about 52, 53% of the time. Okay, right, and the seven minutes is an increase in time. Uh, the 7.30, we got a right. minute and 30 seconds uh, due to this consultant report that, that appear to be achievable. Right, and a lot of that I understand is for the topography and, and sort of the conditions it's, around San Diego. Exactly, the city of San Diego is not a grid-based, the streets are not laid out like it would be maybe in Kansas or in the Midwest where it's very grid-like. I mean, we've got a lot of canyons that intersect you know, the roads here in San Diego. Okay, and Liam, your report shows that the department is often not meeting even this uh, seven and a half minute goal. Right. How often did you find they were late? Well, for the highest priority instance, sort of your high priority cardiac arrest, choking, shooting, very, again, the highest level of incident call that the fire department gets, they've missed an average, uh, they come late an average of twice every single hour, every single day um, over the 21, 21 month period that we looked at. So that was more than 37,000 times. And if you count the lower priority incidents in there too, 
we're talking a rate almost double that. So uh, late frequently. A little bit significant. And yeah. CityGate, that was the consulting firm uh, for the fire department, found that neighborhoods with the longest emergency response delays are within nine and a half miles uh, east and uh, south of downtown. They include City Heights around Home Avenue, uh, Paradise Hills, College Area, Skyline, and Encanto. So Chief uh, Fennessy, why do these neighborhoods have a particularly long delay? You know, historically, you know, very busy response areas. I, I personally served at Station 17 for a number of years, which is in Mid-City, and experienced it myself. Uh, many of us believe that a lot of that has to do with population density. I mean, we've got a lot of people living in those areas. Um, we'd have to go back and look at the demographics and identify, you know, is, is, do we have an elderly population there? What is the, the, the crime that takes place there? What are those things? We've got a number of interstates and highways that intersect through that part of the city. All of that contributes to the response volume. And Liam, do you find that th this is a lack of fire stations, that nearby, close by fire stations? Did you find that in, in research? Well, that's this? what the city has identified as a, the sort of the means to fix this problem, is to build more fire stations. That's the sort of the agreed upon solution by the city. The problem is the city's not very good at doing that. Uh, they committed to, you know, spending, uh, uh, building these five new fire stations to help these five priority areas by the middle of 2017 at a cost of 40 $49 million, they haven't put a dime at this point to funding any of them. And so that's the solution that's been identified. They just haven't followed through. In uh, Chief Fennessy, what do you feel the solution is? Is that something that we can actually attain, building the new <laughs> stations, or because of whatever's happening at the city was, as far as money goes, is there an alternative? Well, you know, clearly, you know, the, the solution to the problem to get to that 90 percentile is we need more resources. We need more firefighters. Um, Otherwise, we're just not going to get much better than where we are now. Um, one of the uh, items that was identified, well, let me back up. You, you have one specific, uh, you have a, an alternative that might cost a little less. Tell us about that plan. We've got 19 service gaps. That's what the consultant identified. We, you, fire stations should go in all 19. However, we realize that 19 is probably not going to be achievable in our lifetimes. There are some areas that definitely need 10 fire stations. There are some gap areas or seam areas as we like to call them between you know the fire stations that could benefit from what we're calling a fast response squad. It's a concept that was brought forward by the consultant. You know we're not sure sort how of a viable. a mini team that could get there sooner maybe? Two person, truck, non-transport, ambulance, paramedics that could quickly fill in the gap in those seam areas, get to the patients quickly. For fires, respond to fires, open up the buildings, prepare for the first in-engine companies. So we think there may be, it may be a viable concept, but we really need to pilot the program to identify. And we certainly don't want those to take the place of fire stations. We need fire stations. Okay, I want to let folks know that they can read Liam's entire story and link to the interactive map on first responder times by going to our website, kpbs.org. And they can also read the CityGate uh, recommendations and that full report as well. So journalist Liam Dillon and Assistant Fire Chief Brian Fennessy, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. The Marine Corps base at Miramar got its first visit from its newest multi-purpose fighter jet and says this year's air show in October will still feature flying, but the performers will be non-military. It was a day for the history books as the first F-35 fighter jet touched down at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar. At 51 feet long and 35 feet wide, the F-35 really doesn't look that big, but it can do what three fighter jets can do using a single pilot. And it can do it at one and a half times the speed of sound. Sergeant Matt Hockgeiger says they wanted to introduce the new aircraft and refuel on its way back to Yuma. This plane will, in my mind, take over as uh, our main fighter and attack units. For the Marines, Navy, and Air Force, it doesn't come without controversy. The entire fleet of jets had to be grounded earlier this year after a crack was discovered in one of its engine turbine blades. Miramar hopes the public will get a closer look during this year's air show when 14 acts will perform, but because of sequestration, none of them will be military planes. Colonel John Fornham says despite the changes this year, will be more like a carnival atmosphere with plenty of opportunities to mix and mingle with the public. The most important thing we have in the Marine Corps isn't F-35s or F-18s, it's our Marines. And uh, they are what make everything possible. Without them, 
uh, we would be a shadow of ourselves. So uh, that's what they're here to come and see. That's uh, the draw, and they won't go home disappointed. The air show usually draws half a million people and generates an estimated $17 million. Some sponsors have dropped out, but the Miramar Air Show will go on October 4th and 5th. And the Patriots will headline this year's show at Miramar. The pilots are all former military and Blue Angel flyers. Some upbeat news about our economy, first from the University of San Diego. Its index of, area, of our area's leading economic indicators rose for the 10th straight month with gains in help wanted ads, building permits, and the consumer confidence. Of course, those were offset, however, by unemployment claims and declining local stock prices. But overall, the index rose a tenth of a point. And Standard & Poor's says home prices are still going up. Its Case-Shiller Index reports a 3% increase for San Diego in May. Its larger 20-city survey shows a 12% increase. There's a new push to get San Diegans to spend their money at home. It's called Think Local First. Peggy Pico has more. The idea behind Think Local First is to grow jobs, increase the local tax base, and keep business revenues circulating in our own communities. A number of chambers of commerce support the plan. Here to tell us how it works are Deborah Rosen, president and CEO of San Diego North Chamber of Commerce, and local business owner Ryan Stevens. Welcome. Thank you. Deborah, a lot of people think, hey, look, I shop at my grocery store, I, I shop locally. Where does most of that money go? Um, Any time a consumer will, shops anywhere, they should know automatically 1% of whatever it is that they're spending there in that retailer or that restaurant will go back into the community in which they've spent that money. So just 1%. And you have some examples, though, that uh, the money being spent outside, for instance, with the uh, San Diego uh, City vehicles. Right. Um, there are some cities that purchase their vehicles outside of the region. They might purchase them up in Northern California instead of inside their particular city. And 1% of any purchase made will go back into that community where that purchase is made through sales tax revenue and is used for city infrastructure, um, police, and fire. So it's kind of like recycling our, our dollars on, exactly. on a, a higher level. Now, your report actually broke it down by North County cities, and you found that in purchases over $15,000, Poway uh, had just over 44%. They sent that money out of the area. They were spending it out of the area. Escondido, about 48%, and in San Diego County, almost a third, 32.4% uh, of the money in that region was spent elsewhere and left there. So we didn't get the uh, benefits of that 1% certainly coming back. Tell us how Think Local First would keep that money closer to home. Well, it's really important that the government, the school districts, um, the consumers, rethink their buying and take a look at how they can change up a little bit of what they're doing just to keep some of that money in the region. So for example, in the city of Poway, if every single resident took just $2,000 a year that they're spending outside of the region and spent it inside for the instance, region. online. Online, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. that, that city would generate an additional seven to $900,000 in sales tax revenue that could be put back into the city infrastructure creating vibrant communities. And it could certainly help local businesses. Now, Ryan, you own replica printing with branches in, in, branches in uh, San Diego and Poway. Yeah. How do you think this initiative would help your business? Well, it would, it would help my business if this got awareness out to the public and other businesses in San Diego, and they just challenged themselves to look at their vendor list and, and you know, if they're shopping outside of San Diego or buying their, their printing outside of San Diego, just to kind of challenge themselves and say, hey, you know, let's keep it local. Let's keep the money back in San Diego. And can you match this price if it is about price? Then they'll, you know, they'll get the product sooner. You know, they'll be helping small businesses and hopefully helping our economy. And I know as far as jobs go, um, I understand that this is supposed to help increase jobs. Do sure. you think it would help uh, you be able to hire more people? Oh, naturally. If, if more people are keeping their business local and giving me business as, aside from online, I'll be able to hire more people. You know, we'll be ramping up. We'll be, you know, printing more and uh, increasing our hours, increasing uh, our, our workforce. Okay, and um, Deborah, now 
is there a way that this is sort of helping the, the tax base and is there a way that you can offer incentives for people to participate in this? Um, I, we, I don't know about incentives. Um, we have a, a committee that is going to be looking at ways that incentives can be generated, but there is a way to help. Um, all homeowners are property tax payers. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but when we pay property taxes, a big chunk of it goes to the school districts. Those school districts, we did a report, which is on the website as well, are spending a huge amount of money outside of the region. We invest our property taxes in those school districts we feel they need to reinvest those funds back into our communities. And so I think we can all start by writing letters to our superintendents at the school saying, hey, look, reinvest back Shop in our locally. community. Shop locally. If you locally. need printing, uh, go see Ryan. There's <laughs> something like that. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Ryan, what do you want other uh, business owners to know? Because I understand right now this initiative is being, you know, basically highlighted up in uh, North County, kind of north of 52. What do you want to tell business owners? Well, check out thinklocalfirst.com and San Think Local First. Uh, San Diego SD.com and uh, see what's available uh, see what other businesses are are you know campaigning and, and championing this 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 effort and uh, help each other out help local businesses uh, you know build vibrant communities kind of uh, helps ourselves as well sure. all right well Deborah Rose and Ryan Stevens thank you very much I want to let folks know they can find out more about this by going to our website think local first and they can go to our website kpbs.org thank you thank you thank you I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour of verdict in the trial of Bradley Manning, charged with aiding the enemy by releasing classified documents to WikiLeaks. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. There's a high surf advisory tonight for Oceanside and the coast from Point Loma down to uh, Imperial Beach. It's in effect until tomorrow afternoon. Coastal temperatures mostly in the low to mid 70s for the next few days, upper 70s to low 80s for the inland valleys. Upper 80s for the mountains, sunny and hot in the desert. Today is Lawrence McKinney Day in San Diego. He's the retiring assistant police chief and the third African American to rise to the top at police headquarters. Speak City Heights reporter Megan Burks looks at his legacy and what's next. I'm doing very well. How are you? Lawrence McKinney is retiring Thursday after 30 years on the San Diego police force. I'm going fishing. <laughs> no, no, I don't fish. Um, <laughs> but when you think of people fishing, you think of someone up on a, on a river bank or something and they're kicked back, not a care in the world, just, just relaxing. And that's what, what I want to do. He says he can't fathom what that feels like, relaxation, because for the last six years, he's held on to some of the most demanding jobs on the force, assistant chief, and before that, overseeing patrols in City Heights. When he was assigned to the neighborhood in 2008, its 12 square miles accounted for nearly a quarter of San Diego's violent crimes. I could have gone to, and in fact was asked, if I wanted to move on to other commands, there are other commands that are easier to work. <laughs> I'll tell you that right up front. But McKinney says simply being present in the diverse low-income community was how he would make the biggest impact. When people saw me as a person of color in uniform, and they can see the goal. They, they don't know what it means, but they know that it's something and it's different. But they see that and it gives them some hope in the system then if they can see me and see that, okay, you know what, maybe there, there is hope and there's maybe a person of color can get somewhere, maybe I can get there. McKinney's office on the seventh floor of police headquarters is covered with plaques and mementos. There's even a photo of him with Michelle Obama. It's quite insane in here because I don't think I have any wall space left. <laughs> hidden away in an album is a photo of him wearing bell bottoms and a floral shirt with exaggerated collars. It was taken in Tacoma, Washington shortly before McKinney joined the Marine Corps. He says back then it was common for him to get stopped by police simply because of his race. He says the experience is what charted his career path and informed his decisions throughout. When officers returned to the station frustrated because witnesses wouldn't cooperate, he gently reminded them that sitting their sons and neighbors on the curb in handcuffs wasn't helping. They weren't seeing things from the perspective of a, a lot of, of people of color um, that sometimes law enforcement is not viewed as the hero of the story, um, sometimes quite the opposite. To further instill trust in the community, McKinney forbade officers from taking their breaks in the station. 
people would come up and thank me for infusing all of these new officers <laughs> into the community. They thought we got all these new officers. We didn't get any new officers. They were just seeing the officers who did work there more. Uh, and that, of course, increased their level of comfort in the community, knowing that, that there's cops out there on the streets. And when former gang members wanted to host a lowrider festival in the station parking lot? The red flags were going up for me and for my officers that it, it was off the charts. They just said, no, absolutely not. We can't risk this. Um, all these gangsters in here. McKinney went for it anyway. Now the festival is in its fourth year and helps connect current gang members and kids at risk of joining gangs to social services and area churches. We are there to serve all the people in the community. We needed to reach everyone. Uh, so that dope addict out there, that gangster out there, uh, you know, we are their police too. Megan Burks, KPBS News. On Thursday, the police department will honor McKinney with a traditional walkout. Tonight's stories are online at kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Good night.